Our first session of the day will be a discussion with authors Ben Goldfarb and Leila Phillip, Leila Phillip, moderated by Bob Boucher. Bob is the founding president of the Superior Bioconservancy. His interests include protecting and restoring keystone species and ecosystems and bioregional landscape linkages. His 2020 study, titled Hydrological Impact of Beaver Habitat Restoration in the Milwaukee River Watershed, modeled how beaver restoration would support flood mitigation, biodiversity, and provide billions of dollars in ecological services. We will put a link to that study in the chat. Please welcome our moderator for this session, Bob Boucher. Thank you for joining us today. Um, ben Goldfarb is an environmental journalist whose work has appeared in Science, Mother Jones, Orion Magazine, The Guardian, and many other publications. He's the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. His next book, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet, will be published by W.W. W. Norton and Company in September, and it's available now. Leela Phillip is an award-winning author whose most recent book, Beaverland, How One Weird Rodent Made America, is a New York Times editor's choice in an NPR Science Friday book selection. A Guggenheim Fellow, Philip has been awarded fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. She was a contributing columnist at the Boston Globe and teaches in the Environmental Studies Program at the College of Holy Cross, where she holds the Brooks Chair in Humanities. I'd like to recommend both their books because they're excellent. Ben, since Eager was published in 2018, you have spoken to numerous groups across the country about the ecological value of beavers. Leela, since Beaver Land was published last December, you've been crossing the country for book tours and speaking engagements. Can you share a bird's eye perspective on what's happening on the ground in terms of beaver advocacy and our beaver restoration? For example, is there a region or project that stands out for you? Sure, I'll, I'll take I'll take first crack at that. So I, I live in I live in Colorado, where beaver restoration is is very much uh, in in full swing. And you know, down here, because our streams are sort of historically degraded, of course, as they are all over the country um, by overgrazing, mining, other other impacts. You know, we 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 have a deficit, I would say, in many watersheds of suitable beaver habitat, right? And the solution there, in, in many cases, is the construction of beaver dam analogs, you know, these beaver mimicry structures uh, that basically serve as beaver kickstarters. Uh, you know, they they kind of lay the groundwork for beaver recovery and reintroduction and, and natural recolonization uh, in systems where beavers might not otherwise thrive because they've, they've been historically degraded. And, you know, I think that often, you know, you hear beaver dam analogs discussed as this kind of standalone project, but they, of course, they really work the best in partnership with the beavers themselves, right, who maintain BDAs and build uh, new, better dams of their own. So this, you know, this kind of beaver dam analog construction assisting natural beaver recolonization um, is, you know, is, is happening at a, an enormous scale in Colorado. You know, there are certainly projects uh, that have built hundreds of structures uh, and restored many, many miles of, of degraded streams uh, and have seen, uh, you know, a pretty, a pretty spectacular uh, beaver response as a, as a result of that. So, yeah, down, down here in the Southwest, you know, because we don't, um, you know, we, we tend to have, you um, you know, watersheds that are a little bit steeper, flashier, um, a little more disconnected potentially than yours in the Midwest. Um, you know, that's the the sort of thing that we have to do to uh, you know sort of facilitate beaver recovery. And you know, no doubt there are plenty of degraded streams in the Midwest that would also benefit from uh, from beaver dam analog uh, construction and and that form of you know low tech process based stream restoration and you know we're certainly seeing uh, enormous success with it uh, here in here in Colorado Thank you Ben Leela what um, what did you tell us about what you've been seeing Well um you know I just want to second um Ben's enthusiasm for that work it's really exciting um you know here in the the east where we we tend to have a lot of beavers working um I I've actually seen a lot of interesting work analog work BDA work going on in the Chesapeake area which is interesting where they're trying to get beavers back for 
stream restoration and water storage and flood control and all those things and to help clean up the Chesapeake Bay. But what I'd like to bring some um, light on is the really interesting work that's going on around the country for policy work in terms of beaver management, because I think this is really important. And there's some just important shifts that are, I think, I would say kind of moving the beaver believer movement a little bit more toward the mainstream in a really significant way. So, you know, California passed statewide beaver initiative to support projects that harness beavers. And um, there's a new beaver management policy that's prioritizing non-lethal deterrence. That's that's huge. Um, and, a, and a statewide beaver working group. Um, Oregon also has passed legislation. Now it isn't up for a final vote yet, but it, but it is is removing the predatory status of beavers. So if that is you know finalized, that also will be huge. And in Congress, um, State Representative Susan Delvane has put forward the Developing Alternative Mitigation Systems Dams Beavers Act. And again, this is this is really significant where we've got policy on a national level recognizing the value of what beavers do. And that would really um, put beavers in the running for um, uh, federal monies uh, that are being harnessed toward watershed um, uh, projects. So I, I think in all these ways, the value that beavers can contribute in terms of their value toward river health is being recognized and that's significant. Um, and we can't have beavers in tributaries and streams and healthy rivers if we don't have habitat for them and if they get, and if they aren't recognized um, for the value they're doing. So, so I, I think this is really significant. And back here in Easton at the Beaver Institute, these national working groups, which are national, so they're not literally located in the East, but the nexus is here, you know, working on, on these issues throughout the country. This is, this is huge. Um, this has really taken, uh, uh, the recognition that we need to look at how to address beaver management in all the different states, which right now varies widely. So for example, here in Connecticut, you can't relocate, you can't translocate beavers. Um, even if I had a problem beaver and I, and, I, and I had a place to put it, I can't move it. Um, without such a special permit, it's not really feasible. So things like that, um, getting a national database of what the different regulations are is, would be very valuable. So, um, and one one final thing, I think there's an exciting and really important idea, if my five minutes is not up, that I know um, folks at the Beaver Institute in, one, in the National Working Group are working on, which is a, um, a beaver habitat lease program where there could be uh, financial incentives for landowners to set aside habitat for beaver. And that is huge because we're living in a moment where we basically have the tragedy of the commons, where we have degraded habitat, degraded stream systems, a devastated wetland system. We know that. And yet we can't ask private landowners to pay the price for repairing those systems by setting aside land that they might need to farm. So how do we compensate a farmer or a landowner to put aside important land so that beavers can do the valuable work they, they need to do. We need incentives for that, just conservation easements, the way we've had for other species. And um, that's that's gonna be huge. Thank you, uh, that's excellent. Yeah, having this involved potentially in a farm bill, uh, incentivizing across the country would be yeah. terrific. Ben, your book covers a lot of ground across North America. You write that in researching Eager, you traveled from the slick rock deserts of Utah to the hardwood forests of Vermont to a highway side canal in Napa, California. I met beavers on farms and beavers in forests, beavers in raging rivers and beavers in irrigation digits, beavers in wilderness areas and beavers in Walmart parking lots. What should our audience know about beavers in order to understand how they are able to survive and even thrive in such disparate settings? Yeah, great, great question, Bob. I mean, certainly they're they're incredibly adaptable, and obviously they create their own habitat, right? Uh, that's that's sort of their their genius in a, a lot a lot of ways. And you know, I mean, one one example of that that I'll add to the litany of places that Bob mentioned last last month, I, I went to Alaska to report a 
an article about uh, sort of the northern expansion of beavers, uh, you know, as, as the climate warms, uh, you know, their ponds don't freeze to bottom uh, as readily. And, you know, the, the kind of the willow line is pushing north onto the tundra and beavers, you know, sort of this incredibly adaptable creature uh, are moving onto the tundra. Uh, and there, you know, it was, it was just incredible to see you know, beaver innovation in a sense. Uh, you know, the lodges were gargantuan um, because they had just packed them with so many layers of mud insulation to defend against, uh, you know, the Arctic winter. And the ponds uh, and canals were incredibly deep, uh, I think, because, you know, they freeze to bottom, right? And they're trying to, in the Arctic, and they're trying to, you know, deepen those those ponds uh, to prevent that freezing to bottom. So it was just kind of amazing to see this, uh, you know, again, this sort of this beaver innovation in a, you know, a relatively uh, novel habitat for them. So they're just an incredibly uh, adaptable organism. And, you know, I think one one thing uh, worth noting is that, you know, the, the only thing that limits beaver presence is essentially our tolerance, right? I mean, you know, these are these are potentially uh, incredibly urban animals. They'll, you know, they'll live wherever we let them live. Uh, you know, in, in Seattle, uh, I think something like 75% of available beaver habitat is presently occupied, right? It's, you know, and again, in one of the, in the largest metropolitan areas in the country, you know, these animals are not like grizzly bears or or wolves, you know, they're, these are creatures that, that very happily live amongst us uh, if we allow them to, um, you know, through things like uh, flow devices and tree fencing and other, you know, relatively simple low tech beaver conflict mitigation systems, right, that we need to incentivize, as as, uh, as Leila mentioned. Uh, you know, Bob mentioned uh, the Walmart parking lot, you know, which I think is just a, a beautiful little illustration again of how urban these animals can can truly be that was a site in uh, in Logan Utah uh, that I visited working on this book where beavers had moved into this little pocket wetland uh, next to a, a parking lot uh, of this you know this this giant this giant Walmart uh, you know they had created this you know, this great little postage stamp of uh, of wetland uh, fish and wildlife habitat and you know I think that for most of human history uh, the default has been to trap them out of a place like that. Um, you know, not necessarily because they were creating conflict, but because they created the perception of future potential conflict, right? There are beavers here. Let's get the beavers out of here before anything bad happens, before they flood anything. Um, but instead, you know, in, in partnership with uh, Utah State University, you know, this the Walmart basically put in this kind of uh, you know, iter iterative adaptive management plan where, we're, you know, we're going to start by putting in a flow device and, you know, and see if that reduces the water level a little bit and, you know, and, and mitigates the possibility of flooding. And, you know, and if that doesn't work, you know, then we'll do some uh, some live trapping and, and relocation. But, you know, the, the default um, was not removing the beavers, wh which, again, is sort of the default approach of communities all over the country. The default was you begin with non-lethal mitigation with coexistence uh, and, you know, you adapt from that point if you have to, right? So again, you know, these are incredibly adaptive animals that will live anywhere we, we let them live. And, you know, the only thing that uh, limits their their habitat is essentially uh, our own ability to tolerate them. And, you know, in, in some quarters, fortunately, that's, that's changing. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Leela, beavers are often referred to as a nuisance or pest, especially across the Midwest. Um, in your book, you write that Lewis Henry Morgan, who studied and documented an enormous beaver complex uh, near Marquette, Michigan, which I'm familiar with, and he started this in 1862. And he was the first one, to, he was the first person to really recognize that beavers are the only animals apart from man that deliberately and continually transform their environment. As humans, we, for, we prefer to be the ones who are in, in charge or in control of the outcome, such as the form of a river. What, it, what does a river look like? How do we change that narrative from nuisance to industrious ecosystem engineer? Wow, what a great question. I feel like you could have a whole conference about that. Um, so thanks for throwing it to me. Um, ben and I were saying the other day that we'd like to have just a whole conversation between the two of us about that question. But um, <laughs> just to, to say, a uh, great answer, Ben. And um, following around fur trappers, I went behind a lot of Walmarts and Home Depots. But um, so I, to answer this question, I actually want to take you here to Woodstock, Connecticut, and share my screen and share a very quick story of um, not just landscape transformation, but I think human transformation. Because this is an example of how, um, in 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 one example, 
sort of people can learn. So if if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be allowed to share the screen, I think, um, Hannah, right? Yeah, and you can. can I do that now? I'm gonna show a couple slides and I just wanna 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 um share a little story with you because this is an example. I mean, Morgan was an industrialist. He went out to the UP to help his railroad friends um basically build the railroads that were going to extract the iron ore um, that was going to destroy the beaver habitat. And then he had this problem of falling in love with beavers inadvertently, but he was still looking at them um, from that 19th century um, viewpoint of we can, we can have it all. We can um, extract away without, um, sorry, consequence. So I'm going to go to the top here and get going with my five minutes. Okay. So this is um, a little area near where I live. In Beaverland, I write about uh, discovering that the beavers that had um, fled my local beaver pond, I, I found them later in an area called Rocky Hill. Um, recently, uh, was able to fly a drone over and take a look at the bottom section. And you can see it's being transformed into a mini beaver land. It's just gorgeous. In July, um, they built a lodge. You can see it there. Um, and what's significant about this, and this is the, there are three dams now, and this is the bottom dam. It's this beautiful, delicate structure that's now holding um, millions of gallons of water. And what's significant about this story and this is the crowded east. So this um, is the first dam that these beavers built. And this is the big drumlin called Rocky Hill that um, is to the right of it. And Woodstock is basically a drumlin field, which is a series of glacially carved hills with streams running around them. So historically, beavers would have been there filling all those stream corridors with water. But since colonization, they've been pretty much dried out. So in 1934, uh, there was really no, not much water here at all and no ponds because in 1934, there were no beavers. Beavers were extirpated from Connecticut and only reintroduced in 1914. And they were reintroduced to Union, Connecticut about 10 miles away, but only 20 years earlier. So you can see no water, no beavers. By 1990, this same spot looks like this. Beavers are here. Um, there's a major beaver pond here to the right, and there's the lodge. It still exists today. And the beaver site that I am studying now and watching the story of, and want to share the story of, here's the dam, was full of water. By 1990, humans had taken advantage of this, and the landowner who owns the farm now bought the farm in 1770, I mean, 1970, sorry. And um, uh, in 1930, they had uh, made a pond here, let the beavers, left this beaver worked pond alone, but they had manipulated this pond and built a berm and dug this pond out. So what's interesting is that the beavers disappear. They're probably trapped out Again, this whole area is dried out. When I find my beavers that I write about in the book Beaverland, they're living here. This is their lodge. Um, so flash forward to 2019, 2016. The beavers are up here, but this is dry. Um, and this is dry because the beavers are content to stay here and they were historically kept out of here. So the stream has pretty much disappeared. Um, it's an example of how a stream can just go under and it comes back up down here. And what's remarkable about what I watched happen recently is that the beavers from um, kind of a, a little tragedy, their dam uh, was breached in November they fled the upper pond. It was a freaky warm winter. So they actually came down to this area, managed to fell some trees. And I've been documenting it since. Um, I've had wildlife cameras up Two, just two beavers. We think they're two years old. They've managed to create a pond here. And then you saw the drone footage of this lower pond here 
they have built a dam here and they have that dam here. So in a matter of months, uh, I should say, I'm grateful to Dr. Denise Berkstead, who I write about in Beaverland. She helped me put these, um, do some of these studies of the water. Mike Callahan from the Beaver Institute came down and helped me measure the dam. And I've been monitoring it since. And, um, and it looks like this. And what's really special, I think, about this story and why I wanted to share it with you is that the landowner and here's the, the growing lodge. They just built this in July and it's not a very impressive lodge. And it's a bit worrying because um, the beavers are young and the water's not very deep. And it's now almost October. Are they gonna get deep enough water? They need at least three feet to get through the winter. Um, are they gonna be able to get a food cache? We don't know if they're a mated pair. Um, so. I'm not sure they're going to survive. Uh, the rest of the lodge didn't make it um, from the exodus. But what's wonderful and remarkable is that this stream has been reconnected. Millions of gallons of water are here. This is an incredibly rich biodiversity hub now of, in spring, all kinds of migrating ducks and birds were there. And the landowner, um, has become really interested in the beavers and really interested in having the beavers stay. So I just gave him a copy of Beaverland in December after it came out. I thanked him for letting me be on the land all those years and walk it. And, you know, I think education, um, understanding why people do what they do. The dam was broken because there was concern that they might flood that road. Um, Mike Callahan came down and talked to him about the alternative coexistence strategies of when the beavers move back up, because they probably will, putting in a pond leveler. He's open to that. So I think in the future, this is going to become a really dynamic, exciting hub of beavers for the area. Um, previous to this, I learned that the, the beavers had just been coming and going because the dam kept getting broken and they had to flee. And probably they were you know, these be beavers survived, but maybe some years they just didn't. So I think the way we change the narrative is by trying to educate people, trying to figure out what their needs are. Um, he was a good steward of the land. He just needed to learn about beavers. But I think you really have to approach people um, with understanding um, and um, really, um, and a lot of respect and, and kind of what, what I learned is sort of slowly. And, um, another reason why I have wildlife cameras up is so that I can share the footage with the landowner and, and they can see the beavers up close. And that's really, really made a difference because these beavers are completely fetching and they're very young. They talk to each other all the time. They're, they were clearly super insecure back in January. It was like, they were like, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, I've been sharing pictures of them with um, Glynis Hood and other you know people. And um, so anyway, I think my five minutes are up, but I just wanted to share that as an example of, um, you know, how we really change the narrative is, is how we change our relationship to the natural world. But case by case, I think education. Thank you, Leela. That's a great story for, for sharing that. And I think there's uh, variations of that story that are happening across uh, many places in the Midwest, and it's a matter of uh, this coexistence and realizing the benefits and how much water can be stored and how basically beavers restore the wetlands. Each of you write about the history of North America, a continent, and how the near extirpation of beavers during the height of the fur trade dramatically and can changed our landscape and river function. The term ecological amnesia gets used to describe how we no longer understand the role that beavers played in shaping our continent and how our rivers once functioned. The hydrology was quite different. What is an example of something our Midwest audience should remember about beavers to help us value or coexist with them? Or can you expect, expand on this concept of ecological amnesia? Yeah, it's a, a great, a great question, Bob. And thanks, Lily, for sharing that that fantastic story. I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, I, I think I think that one important point that gets at the 
ecological amnesia concept is that when we trapped out several hundred million beavers during the course of the industrial fur trade, we profoundly changed the landscape's capacity to support beavers, right? Beavers, of course, as engineers of their own habitat, create the conditions in which they themselves thrive. You know, in a, a beaver-rich stream, all of those beaver dams are essentially acting as speed bumps, right? Slowing water down and spreading water onto the floodplain. And when you lose all of those beaver built speed bumps, you know, there's nothing checking the velocity of water and you often get this catastrophic erosion and incision and down cutting, uh, you know, that results in streams that are trapped within their banks and can't access the floodplain. And that's an incredibly difficult situation in which to be a beaver, right? If the, if the stream is trapped within its banks like a fire hose, that's a hard place to build a dam Beavers want to access the floodplain, and if you know if a stream is downcut by fifteen or twenty feet, um, they can't they can't do that. And that's you know those those are really the situations in which beaver dam analogs, uh, you know, are, are valuable because they slow water, capture some sediment, bump up that stream bed a little bit, and you know give the animals themselves a chance to access that that floodplain again. But you know I think that's a again a really important point that is is often lost um, is that, uh, you know, is that it's it, we can't simply uh, expect these animals to recolonize on their own. Um, I mean, certainly they do that in, in, in many cases, but, you know, in, in many degraded watersheds, you know, we, we do need to give them a, a, a leg up, I think, because, uh, again, when we destroyed these animals, you know, we we destroyed the landscape. You know, we don't think about beaver trapping in the same terms as, you know, the industrial uh, deforestation of New England or the busting of the sod in the Midwest or, you know, gold mining in the Sierra Nevada, right? We don't consider uh, fur trapping, you know, sort of a seminal ecological catastrophe, but, you know, in some ways it was the original sin, you know, it preceded all of those things. And, and uh, you know, again, it, it, it changed the landscape's capacity to support beavers. Um, and that's a, you know, a big part of why our, our beaver populations, uh, you know, remain really depressed today. And Lila, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Gosh, I mean, it's there's so much to say. I mean, on the ecological amnesia, on which aspect? Well, I think just from your own perspective of this recognition of that we've forgotten what we had in terms of the hydrology of the United States and in terms of that by recognizing their, their restorative capacity, just in the slides that you just showed, um, just... How do how do you think this how do you think this movement and this this change will occur across the United States? Well, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is that um, it's not just the water. I mean, the water we can see is just the beginning, but the beaver damming and to pick up. I mean, thank you, Ben. That was a great answer. the The water that we can see is just the beginning in the sense that first of all, there's the visible basin of water and then there's that great invisible sponge of water underneath. So the average beaver pond holds three times as much water underneath and contributes to the hyper re zone, right? So that this, this, this whole idea that, um, I mean, one of the things that really blew my mind studying beavers and learning about rivers was this idea that that underneath the surface channel of a river, there's another flow of water through the land. And I think that's really hard for people, the average person to kind of get their head around if you're not a river scientist, that, that there's sort of another river flowing under the river. It's, it's, but it's a vital part of our water system. And so in a way, that's the story also of what I watched these two little beavers do, right? They went to a dry area and they didn't dam up um, running water they actually pulled subsurface water up from below to build their pond. So they reconnected this a hidden section of the stream system. But I think what I was getting at is that the, the beaver damming complexes, and I think this dovetails with what Ben was saying, they set in motion hydrologic and geologic and you know geochemical and ecological and environmental changes that were really only beginning to fully understand and therefore be able to quantify. So we, we've called them a keystone species for a long time because we could see their impact on animal species. So we know their impact on biodiversity. We can say you have beavers and plants and animal species increased by 30%. 
we can measure the water and say you have 15 times more plankton. But, but I think what river scientists are now starting to say to us is it's actually even bigger than that because their impact on the hyperreic zone through the contribution of these beaver damming complexes is really profound in terms of the contribution to the health of the river system. So if you start thinking about beavers as part of river ecology, not as separate from it, then they're really quite important to the watershed. And I think one of the things we really need to start thinking about, I mean, I know like wildlife managers and people who manage um, parks and conservation lands, they have to balance all kinds of needs, needs of hunters and trappers and people who wanna use the land for different reasons and different species of animals. But sometimes I hear people taking out beavers and say, oh, I just, I need to get rid of the water there because I need a cornfield so that I can have, you know, grouse for hunters. But I think that may be so, and that may be the right decision, but they need to think it's a lot more than just taking out a pond of water, right? There's an ecological system that's being removed. So the full value of what's being taken out when you take out beavers needs to be understood and put into the equation. I think that is really an important shift that still needs to happen in the Midwest, maybe in particular, where it seems like there's a lot of confusion about what benefits fish or not. And you know, it's not just about how we're gonna face climate change, it's how we're gonna face you know, dwind biodiversity and, and um, loss of spe all kinds of species. Right. Well, those are both. Uh, thank you both. Uh, those are excellent answers. Um, Hannah is going to field some uh, questions that came in from the chat. And it's, it seems that from both of you that really our rivers are impoverished without beavers uh, and that they they they, they bloom in, in the hyporic zone. So uh, Leela and Ben, thank you so much. I'm going to let Hannah come in with these um, uh, questions from the chat. And um, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really great presentation. Thank you both um, for sharing, you know, your wisdom and your experiences. Um, Leela, kind of going off of your last question, um, could you discuss any research that quantifies how beavers help convert flooding liabilities into groundwater assets? Um, for example, like might the return of healthy beaver populations help communities regenerate declining groundwater supplies? Well, I think, I mean, the study that, um, you know, Bob did out in 2021 in Milwaukee is a really important study, University of Wisconsin, and everybody should look that up. I mean, that is really significant looking at the watershed resiliency and how much um, water, flood water storage was created by putting beavers up in the watershed. There's a, a study at the University of Helsinki. Um, so those are those are really good examples of, of water storage. And anytime you get water storage, then the water's gonna go down into the aquifer. I actually would be interested to know because recently I've become um, interested in this question. We we have, a, I think, a problem with dwindling groundwater supplies that we really haven't talked about as much. We've been so focused on the issues of wildfire and flooding and drought from, from our warming climate. We haven't really been thinking in the news about uh, just dwindling groundwater, at least out east. Um, so I'm actually not aware of recent studies. Maybe Ben is. Ben, are you um, about just groundwater? But I'm sure they're out there. I think I really think people should look at at that Milwaukee study that I mentioned in Beaverland and University of Helsinki as a start. Ben, do you have anything to suggest to that? Yeah, no, I, th I, th I think you're right, Leela, that, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, groundwater resources by, by, through beaver storage have been sort of, um, you know, not, not fully quantified. Certainly that's, that's, that's true. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the question of converting floodwater to groundwater is, it, you know, that's a fascinating one. Study, you know, there's there's lots of fantastic research that's come out of out of uh, England, you know, the University of Exeter, um, you know, where Eurasian beavers have been reintroduced uh, in recent yeah. years, you know, largely for their flood control benefits, and you know, I mean, they 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 have shown 
that a you know a single colony of beavers, uh, you know, building a, a dozen or so dams in a stream uh, is capable of capturing about thirty percent of major rainfall events. Um, you know, then those those ponds and wetlands that beavers create are slowing, spreading, sinking, storing water, right? And you know, certainly uh, a substantial proportion of that thirty percent is being stored in that flood that floodplain sponge that uh, that Leela was talking about. So yeah, I would encourage anybody interested in sort of the 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 floodwater storage connection to kind of check out some of those University of Exeter studies because those are those are really interesting and applicable I think to North America as well. Yeah, that's right. Thank you for adding that. That's a that's that's a that's a really good resource. It's also about 2122, right? Something like that. But in the um there's more work to be done, I think. Yeah, and this kind of ties into that. Um, you had mentioned, and I'll direct this question to Ben. Um, Leela had mentioned the idea of a sponge, and Ben, you referred back to it, of water under beaver ponds. Um, how does this affect local plants during drought? And, and could this have an effect on climate change or forest fires or any kind of um, mass climate that we're seeing um, in the age of climate change? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the person who's who's addressed that the best is actually our next speaker, uh, Emily Emily Fairfax. And you know, I I, I don't um, I'll try to I'll try to um, I'll try I'll try to sort of presage her her presentation without giving the game away. But you know, what what Emily has shown very clearly is that you know beavers uh, are irrigators, right? And and it's anyway, it's not just that floodplain sponge; it's also the canals are really a really important part of this, right? Beavers are these prolific excavators. They dig these canal networks that spread water across the landscape. Uh, uh, and in so doing, you know, they 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 they're again they're irrigators, you know, and they're they're turning dry brown crispy plants into lush wet green ones. And I'm just you know sort of uh, stealing Emily's Emily's wonder, wonderful language um, for this phenomenon. But in so doing, you know, they create these fantastic fire refugia and fire breaks, you know, which here in the West is so important, right? Obviously, as uh, you know, as, as Emily uh, loves to point out, you know, a um, yeah a, a wet green lush plant is less likely to uh, burn than a you know, a dry brown crispy one. Um, and uh, in so doing, you know, they're really helping, uh, you know, buffer our, our landscapes against wildfire and, and making them uh, more resilient. So Emily, uh, apologies if I if I butchered that uh, and and, uh, and stole some of your, your thunder, but uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentation as I as I always do, Emily. Yeah, and, and um, to, to pick up on that, California is really a leader in this um, with the Beaver Working Group. I mean, they're really thinking intentionally about creating watershed resiliency for wildfire mitigation. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm, we're all looking forward to Emily's talk later. So I'm sure she's going to talk about this, but it, it is really interesting to think how much water is kept underground. And, you know, um, again, I think we, we're so focused on whatever immediate problem we have and, and, you know, wildfires, flooding, drought are very visible to us, but species decline is invisible largely until it affects us directly because our crops don't pollinate or something like that. But it is a really um, a, a huge problem. I think the statistics that are coming out, um, I think I was looking this morning, the World Wildlife um, Planet Report from 2022, which looked at 32,000 species I uh, saw something like 69% of vertebrate decline, which is which is startling. So, I mean, that's international, but still we need to think about beaver damming complexes and wetlands as our kind of coral reefs of North America and, and value them that way because no one's put a dollar sign on biodiversity, but when they do, it's gonna be astronomical. And, and we will be thinking about these things in the future because we're gonna be realizing, especially as it gets hotter, that we're we're gonna be needing species for all kinds of things, maybe medicine, maybe, you know, there are gonna be a lot of things down the line uh, that are gonna come at us, uh, that, we, that, that are gonna be rationales for um, making sure species don't go, go extinct, you know? So I, I, I think uh, it, it's all pointing back to the value of, of creating habitat for beavers now, I guess. Great, yeah, thank you both. Um, and I'm recognizing we have about one minute left, um, but there's a lot of questions about the importance of wetlands. So if you could each give one sentence, um, starting with Ben, um, about the importance of wetlands, if you could just sum up in one sentence, 
between beavers and wetlands, what do you want the audience to take away today? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I can improve upon, upon uh, Leela's description of beaver beaver complexes, coral reefs. That's that's a really, really evocative. And now I'll just I'll just very, very briefly say that I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone in attendance uh, for engaging in the in the beaver conversation and for everything you're doing to uh, you know, help restore uh, these animals to their their rightful place in uh, in North American ecosystems. Um, you know, your your work is really valuable and, and everything we can do to support these creatures is uh, essential right now. And, and I'm grateful to all of you for being part Part of that conversation. Thank you, Ben. And Leela, do you have one last sentence that you want to leave our attendees with? Well, I think one of the things I learned researching and writing Beaverland is that um, I was really humbled and opened to discover um, that there are lots of different ways to love beavers other than the way I did. And I, I think I'm talking really about everything I learned from hunters and fur trappers um, that really opened my eyes to my surprise. And I think it's really important for us to uh, build bridges and um, recognize that um, people can value beavers in different ways that we do. And we're gonna need to recognize that to get there together because we really need everybody at the table. I think that's increasingly important. Thank you, Leela. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Leela, for your presentation. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that if your question wasn't answered, um, we will be kind of sticking around to answer some questions and we'll also be sending a follow-up email um, for that. Um, so that'll conclude our session for today. Um, once again, we wanna thank Ben and Leela for joining us and they'll be sticking around to chat with you in the chat for a little bit. Um, and stay tuned for our next presentation yeah. with Dr. Emily Fairfax to talk more about beavers and climate change. <laughs>